last session in the data and policy uh, room. We are actually very happy to see a lot of people who are actually interested in informal transit or so-called informal transit. Um, the why of this session is basically a lot of us worked or used to work in different parts of the world where public transit as we know it in Canada, in France, in a lot of countries do not exist under well, with the exact same form or shape, we would say. But people still go from A to B. They actually can make their way pretty easily as soon as they understand how the system works uh, to, to get to work, to do the groceries, to actually live a life. And that's a big deal. It means that most people around the planet can actually move from A to B without necessarily using the same transit network that we know here more commonly in bigger cities like Paris, like Berlin, like uh, Montreal, where we are. And we thought it was about time that we give it a real stage. And also, if we want to make sure that we support globally um, to reach a better uh, world, to make it more sustainable, we also can't uh, forget about the global south, we can't forget about people who rely on informal transit as a form of living to make their wages. And why it became important also in terms of data is we actually can't measure something that we don't know about. Like we can try and say, uh, maybe a million riders a day, but if, if we don't have the data, there's no knowledge about it. So we will start with Benji, who is the CEO of uh, SAMC, and he is also the co-founder of Global Partnership for Informal Transportation. He unfortunately couldn't join us today, but he shared his thought with a video. So we will launch the video for you. Hi, good morning from Chicago. I'm Benjamin or Benji de la Pena. I'm the CEO of the Shared Use Mobility Center and the chair of the Global Partnership for Informal Transportation. I'm sorry I couldn't join you in Montreal for this summit, uh, but happy to be here at least to share some ideas uh, virtually. So here's a quick question. What transportation system carries more than 80% of all pu public transportation trips across the world and yet is completely invisible in global policies? Quick answer, informal transportation. And that 80%? Is, probably, is a very rough estimate, and it's probably an undercount because no one counts. What's informal transportation? They come in many forms. They come in two-wheel forms like boda bodas, ojeks, okadas, motosais, mototaxis, siyoms, uh, etc. Uh, they also are called uh, in three-wheel form. Uh, they show up in Pakistan, in Sri Lanka, in India, uh, all across the world, in the Philippines. Uh, they also come in four-wheel forms, like the jeepney, the songtol, the matatu, the vanjai, and they even show up in um, global north cities like New York City with its dollar vans. So informal transportation uh, is a global phenomena, yet it always seems to be treated as a local problem. Emphasis on problem rather than asset. And that's why we formed the Global Partnership for Informal Transportation, to draw attention to this massive emergent phenomena that happens all over the world and yet is completely ignored in the way we think about transportation. Uh, in fact, the very name itself, right? So it has many weird names. It's defined by what it's not. So sometimes uh, it's called paratransit, but that's confusing for North America because in North America we call um, pass, uh, transportation for the disabled paratransit. Or it's called informal transportation, but that begs the question, what is formal transportation? India likes to call it intermediate public transportation. The question is intermediate to what? And we've used names like indigenous transportation, artisanal transportation, popular transportation, or pop transport. Um, the absence of a name means that we, we're not thinking about it enough. And we're only thinking about it in categories that we already know. Uh, I like the way Jackie Klopp puts it, right? Popular transport, while strongly present on the street, is often absent from planning policy and projects. She calls it popular transport because it's for the people and it's by the people. Uh, how widespread it is, is it uh, in a city like Nairobi where there is no formal read 
municipal bus or rail transportation or extensive transportation, 70% of commuters rely on matatus. But even in cities with formal transportation, like Mexico City, 74% of all public transportation trips are through colectivos. So they exist everywhere unless you actively regulate them out and you had the enforcement to regulate them out. So here's another reason why you need to pay attention to informal transportation. Your city, and we're talking not only about the big cities, cities of the world, but the secondary and tertiary cities, will always grow faster than your ability to plan and to provide formal public transportation. Uh, unlike North America and most of Europe, the rest of the world is still rapidly urbanizing, uh, with Latin America be having the highest urbanization rates, but still is urbanizing. And so the cities will always grow faster than your ability to plan and build formal public transportation. So you will have informal transportation. And the numbers are massive, right? In the two wheelers alone in Tanzania account grew from 2000 in 2003 to about 800,000 in 2014. And they generate a lot of money. In Kenya, the estimate was $2.1 billion in revenue. Uh, that's $70 million more than Safaricom. This is in the year 2017. And yet the investment, the government investment profile is very, very different. This is from the Competition Committee of South Africa. They were looking at uh, public transportation investments over a three-year period. And if you look at the chart on the left, it talks about the allocation of subsidies. Uh, about nearly two-thirds go to rail. And then they looked at use of transportation. So in, on the left side, you will see uh, about 1% for minibus taxis investment, government investment. If they looked at the usage of transportation and it was nearly the complete opposite, right? Uh, three, three fourths of the public used minibus taxis and only about a third actually used rail. So lots of investment in modes of transportation that um, not everybody uses. And um, informal transportation emerges for many, many reasons and it's layered on to both history of society and a history of colonial colonialization and ignoring parts of the city, but also policies that uh, prioritize roads and travel of the elite. Uh, I like the way Kenda Mutongi talks about the history of the Matatu, for instance, in her book. Um, and it was really because these were areas that were not important to the white settlers, and so they were not served with whatever transportation, um, public transportation, they started setting up. And of course, these areas grew faster, and that gave rise to the Matatu. And pretty much that story is repeated uh, almost everywhere that has some colonial experience or some domination by a different power. What's really fascinating about these things is that they're not just transportation. They really are venues, too, of self-expression and ingenuity. The picture on the left is an award-winning Matatu. They have beauty contests for Matatus in Nairobi. The picture on the right is... Buses in Karachi, there's actually a genre of Pakistani truck art, and this is all kind of this very loud um, uh, ornamentation. And that same thing happens in chicken buses and colectivos in Latin America. Um, so we formed the Global Partnership for Informal Transportation because we believe they can be powerful engines for economic uh, mobility and creating more sustainable in and inclusive cities, but only if you pay attention to them and think about them in the whole and as part of a global system. Um, I like this quote from Shack and Slum Dwellers, and this goes back to the first question, right? They like to say the first stack of inclusion is to be counted. And in many ways, we haven't counted. There are no global counts for informal transportation, and there are very rarely national counts. Uh, I was part of, I funded, the, when I was working at Rockefeller Foundation, the Digital Matatus Map, which was the first ever map of informal transportation anywhere and got put up on uh, Google Maps and it led to kind of extensions of GTFS. Uh, but that was just step one. And there's been a lot of mapping happening uh, around the world. And what that does is it makes visible the invisible. But as we think about uh, digitizing informal transportation. I'm sure you know this quote from Melvin Kranzberg. It might be a good thing. Uh, the rest of the panelists will talk about the work they're doing with informal transportation, but I'll leave you with a few um, takeaways to think about as you think about digitizing, think about informal transportation and think about digitizing uh, informal transportation. 
First of all, one of the things we learned, this is with Agile City Partners, as we researched digital data collection across the world uh, for shared mobility and informal transportation, that there was a big difference between Global North and Global South. Uh, in the Global North, what happens is a new tech platform emerges, mobility platform, and then they recruit uh, providers into it. And that's basically the TNC Uber model, right? Um, a new service built on a platform. The Meanwhile, in the Global South, where there's existing informal transportation, what a tech platform does is it introduces a new relationship between the existing operators and the existing users, therefore giving you more data. It's an imposition. Uh, so on the North, it's a critical part of the infrastructure. In the South, it's an imposition. And that has uh, implications on how the uh, system works. Uh, I would strongly recommend the research of Vida Quadri, who's looking at how uh, OJEC drivers in Southeast Asia are actually bypassing and using their own technology um, to circumvent um, Gojek and the other ride hail services. And they're using their own platforms. And the same thing is happening, we're seeing uh, in India, where the auto rickshaw drivers have shifted to WhatsApp to get uh, customers that's so that they can they can circumvent right the platform and the cut that the platform has so anyway uh, on to those three lessons the first question that you have to ask as you digitize and think about digitizing informal transportation is whose goals right so this classic story is from James Scott uh, seeing like a city and he talks about the case of fiscal forestry in 18th century Germany Germany was uh, the starting to modernize and the government owned lands, the government owned forests, they wanted to become more efficient. And so they paid attention to counting the trees and they cleared all of the underbrush so that it would be easier to get to the trees and they would plant streets in, uh, the trees in straight rows. Well, guess what? The underbrush was actually very critical to the health of the forest. So they started getting taller, straighter trees in the first few years. And then the, quick, the, the forest quickly started dying off because the underbrush, the small plants that you didn't think were important, were actually very critical to the ecosystem. So what's the goal as you digitize or think about technology and informal transportation? Second is a question of for whose good, right? So here's the case of the Ibumi in Karnataka in India, the state of Karnataka. Ibumi was a World Bank program, is a World Bank program that digitized all of the cadastral maps. That means it's the maps of land holdings uh, across the state. And the whole idea was that you would do this so that you eliminate corruption. And because then the records would be clear. Uh, what it did though, because it was digitized and it was in GIS, the local farmers, especially the fall, uh, small farmers, had no access to these maps. Uh, the full maps, and they don't didn't have GIS spatial analysis. Guess who had them? There were um, real estate uh, brokers in New Jersey, and so and and in the U.S., who were then able to assemble large pieces of land around Bangalore and in many other places in the state, so that they could then uh, buy up the land and build up what they wanted to do. So what it did was it aggregated power, to and it served the, the aggregated information and it served the needs of the people who were more powerful. So whose good is it as you think about technology? Third, whose problem are you trying to solve? So Nairobi has had multiple experiences of trying to use electronic fare payment cards. I think they're on their third try now. And it often fails or it has failed in the past because the point of view was we're going to do uh, electronic fare payments so that it is easier to see what the revenue is and it's easier to collect taxes. Um, when it run, informal transportation runs on a cash economy, one of the reasons why it has to is because there's corruption and so you can't be stopped. Uh, if, you, if a policeman is trying to get a bribe out of you, you can't pay them with electronic fare payment cards. And so this didn't work uh, because the problem they were trying to solve was a problem of taxation and it wasn't the problem of the operators or the problem really of the uh, passengers or there is some predictability of, of revenue they wanted to have or fares, but that wasn't the case. So before we apply technology and think about informal transportation and all of the data that we're, we're collecting or plan to collect, 
think about the problem, think about the relationships, right? Who, who is going to get more power? Uh, and again, who already has power in the system in informal transportation that has been neglected or ignored? The big danger is that as we digitize, you will magnify those power imbalances and asymmetries. Um, so Daniel Agbeboa wrote a really interesting piece in The Republic just last month. Um, and his suggestion really, the, you know, I would say that the, if the first act of inclusion is to be counted, the second act of inclusion is to look closely and look through the eyes of those who you want to be included. And so what would it look like through the eyes of the Danfo operators and drivers if the goal was to make life better for them and their operations better? And what would that do for uh, transportation systems? Uh, lastly, this advice from Rachel Caldicott, of course, is that uh, we've uh, done a lot of harm by collecting a lot of data. We have to be very, very clear of why we're collecting it and uh, also be very clear about for whose benefit. Uh, that's it. Um, I leave you with uh, this plug for subscribing if you want to learn more about our work, GPI transportation, gpittransportation.substack.com for our newsletter, Pop Transport. I myself write my own. I haven't been writing regularly, uh, makeshiftmobilitysubstack.com. Thank you very much and enjoy the conference. And now we will move to Hain, who will tell us all about collecting the data. Hi, please don't fall, fall asleep. I'm Hay. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, digitizing transport in uh, Sub-Sahara Africa. Uh, so I have asked permissions from my WRI Africa colleagues. So they are the one who does uh, most of the groundwork and I'm support playing a supporting role. So uh, just presenting on behalf of them. OK, so just to recap what Benji said, uh, I mean, there are uh, basically, semi formal or informal transport are uh, demand response and schedule flexible services. They are usually provided by self organized small operators. Like one owner might have like uh, two or three buses, and then they will kind of contract out to uh, different drivers and operators. Uh, and yeah, so usually the small to medium sized uh, motorized or non motorized vehicle. And it's operating, it's not like there's no regulation. The regulation is less effective, you can say that way. Uh, but there, there's one term that Benji didn't put, like sometimes people even call like this service as a illegal uh, transport, and that kind of put people in a marginalized uh, positions. But, uh, so this is from uh, Matatu. So uh, Matatu has, yeah, not just the competition, but they also have like a school, art school, where people, uh, like young youths are taught to paint the buses. And they also have very heavy, uh, the loudspeakers on the if you go and you you can get some really uh, new newer music on the uh, if you take Matatu in Nairobi. So uh, this is uh, like I mean the the terminologies are everywhere. I didn't collect those. Well, one, uh, it's also true in Latin America, but I'm just focusing on Sub-Saharan Africa. So this is on the left. You can see all the mini buses, different how local names are called. Uh, Matatu is a term that. Uh, the Nairobi use. Uh, sometimes in some places it's just minibuses like taxi. Uh, even the word paratransit or informal transport is, uh, can be uh, like, it's more of an academic term. Like people on the ground just see like, okay, these are buses you just get from point A to point B. There is no informals or formal for those who are on the ground. Uh, and then, yeah, even though we focus more on the public transport, there's a, a uh, some some of our like Tom map uh, he he just graduated from University of Michigan uh, he mapped this motorcycle taxi across the continent like different names so uh, bicycle not very common but motorcycle they change uh, uh, people's life there like getting from A to P become much easier especially in rural Africa like Nigeria there's studies in Nigeria and also in Nairobi and they change uh, lives but and then the uh, the tricky part is uh, they can be dangerous too. How do you provide access while you try to reduce uh, uh, the, the road safety issues? So these are some more terms. And so um, uh, this is one of the projects that I am supporting. Uh, Benji is saying, be careful <laughs> how you're mapping. The, so we're doing it <laughs> hopefully in a uh, very uh, cautious way. Again, like. Uh, WRI, oh, I'm from WRI, World Resources Institute, somewhere, yeah. 
So uh, we have different offices, and we have WRI Africa office that are based in uh, Kenya, Nairobi, and Addis Ababa, uh, Ethiopia. So the, uh, the, my colleagues from there, they uh, are the spearheading this thing, uh, this DG4A. So uh, mobility data is part of this consortium. So we, you can think of, we are like a transitionary custodians of this uh, digital transport for Africa. So. Uh, the, uh, again, the idea is to do digital mapping of uh, like the way that Benji said, talk about digital metatu, and we try to replicate it in different cities. So far, we have 14 uh, uh, cities data set, and, and those are all open, open, open data. Uh, so the, 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 uh, oh, okay. The way we are doing it is, uh, it's not just about mapping because there, the, the, in the past, the, some of the cities has been mapped multiple times and then the maps just disappear or it's just uh, live in some, I don't know, a database and, and it's become a, prior, a proprietary data and that the city government do not have access to. So the way that we are doing it, we are engaging more on the uh, city level and then asking the city, what do they need and how do you do to make sure this map data are gonna be in your city. So there's uh, not just the mapping problem, but also the how, how can this solve this uh, public transport in your cities. Okay, so uh, there's a repository happening. Uh, the data quality is an uh, issue like we are trying to solve because it's all, uh, but there, the, the other activity, the major activity that we are doing is this thing called uh, DT4 Innovation Challenge. The idea is to crowd solve all these uh, creative and entrepreneurial uh, enterprises in African, uh, uh, across uh, the continent of Africa, and then try to come up with whatever the ideas they have, and then uh, ask them to do some mapping. So they bring up with their own uh, ideas. Some are more developed than others, but there's also a case about uh, business model case. You, uh, if we provide a little bit more money, that can jumpstart their activities. Uh, that, so we, with this background, and we also want uh, all these uh, 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 mapping effort to be coming from the continent of Africa itself. So we launched that uh, in 2021. And then we have, we got 116 uh, submissions. Uh, 96 in English and 20 in French, 29 countries. So uh, next week we'll have a winners announce. Uh, to don't know who the winners are, we're not. Well, I'm not supposed to say that. So uh, for the next year, uh, the, the next 12 months, we'll be working together with them uh, in terms of uh, both the mapping and also um, like uh, also the capacity buildings. So one of the requirement is that they need to know their cities well, so uh, so that we're not just going blindly in one of those cities. Uh, so that that's happening. Uh, no, so it's uh, again, it's not just mapping. Mapping is important, but also trying to make this uh, uh, activity lasting lasting longer by uh, giving them more. Uh, ways more tools to do things. So a uh, concrete example would be like GIS, setting up GIS and using using uh, GIS to do cert certain things. So um, other things that oh, these are the other things that's happening with the uh, uh, DT4A is uh, these are the cities that we are involved in. Uh, we have some sort l levels of engagement. Not all of those are mapping, uh, but like capacity building activities and research. Uh, if you can guess where these cities are, you'll get a brownie point. <laughs> so these are the cities that we are engaging this year and next year. Uh, so the, the red is uh, Addis, uh, the black is uh, Kampala, uh, Uganda, uh, the bottom purple is Nairobi, Kenya. So I, 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 don't, I don't expect to know, but uh, I don't <laughs> so yeah, this is where we're going and where we are now. Yeah. And then again, uh, this is the frameworks of use cases because we are NGO, so we think a little bit more like NGO. Uh, so uh, one of the things that use cases, again, l measuring the sustainable development goal and try, essentially the access and 11.2 uh, to the, with all these maps, and then uh, hopefully the mobility planning uh, by the city government uh, those and the bottom two are more of like uh, developers and like private sector engagements. So, um, 
I guess everybody's talking about access, so I have to I have one map of access. <laughs> so uh, it's the same methodology at this point, uh, trying to uh, use GTFS with the uh, informal data in our case, and then try to we use wall pop, wall population data to 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 get the access to opportunities, uh, and then opportunities is an important thing. So it depends on yeah. So because it's an interactions between land use and transport. So what do you mean by it, transport itself is it, not necessarily enough. So if there are no schools or if there are no clinics, uh, there is the access is going to be really, really low. Uh, so it's uh, it's a good matrix that I feel like a lot of the NGOs and researchers are already using this to calculate. Uh, oh, and other sources of data. Uh, so um, I'm going a little bit beyond mapping and trying to see digital uh, efforts and uh, mobility in uh, Africa. This is from uh, Bridge of Bridges, uh, 2019. Uh, I think they're based either based in Kenya or South Africa. I don't remember, but this is already dated. And because uh, uh, the numbers are more than this, uh, obviously, because uh, you have to be in a particular city to know uh, some type, know where who the players are. You might capture the bigger players, but there might be some. That do, that do not have uh, internet presence or the addresses might not match. Uh, so you have to be really on the ground to uh, see how many to uh, count them. So these are the, some of the additional data sources uh, that could happen. So uh, I, I didn't come up with this. Uh, so Jill and Adam from WRI came up with that. So, so uh, I mean, there are a million frameworks at this point, so, but uh, well, we are using this because uh, WRI make those frameworks. So, so what it means by traditional mobility versus the new mobility, uh, the uh, this part is data and uh, ICT is a, a new part that's kind of uh, reconfigure everything. Depending on your business model, you might emphasize one cycle over another. Um, that's that's how we use and we define new mobility, and and then. Uh, looking at all the mobility services, you they kind of divide into four different ones. And you can also see there are a lot of different subcategory emergence uh, under this. I mean, frameworks, they only true to an extent, and then things fall apart. But uh, it's, that's Tsinghua uh, <laughs> Um So yeah, this is the categories that we use. Uh, in Kampala, you can also see all the we kind of talk to everybody uh, in the cities, uh, the majority of them, and try to understand about wh how wh their pain points and how they're making uh, the trips more efficient. So um, I'm just pointing these out as, data, as examples of where additional data sources can be coming from. Uh, we have this event in Kampala. Uh, thank you, that's me. Uh, thank you, Hei. So why we decided for this panel last minute? I must admit that I want to pay homage to all of my colleagues who started this work way before I joined Mobility Data. And we have in the room Carl and Kayomi, who were the first involved actually with digital transport for Africa. And it's how, when I joined Mobility Data, I discovered this. And then I also want to pay homage to Christiane and Omar, who are in the room, who worked on GOFS and cr putting on demand services on the map. And all of this somehow clicked. And when I thought 12 years back, not a so, so long time ago, when we were, oh, well, when I, I was based in Southeast Asia, I remember struggling to get from A to B, because I didn't know the ecosystem, because I didn't know how to actually ride a Seom, so it's how we call the motor taxi. And when cross the border, going to Cambodia, visiting the Angkor temples for the very first time, I realized that actually the drivers knew. They were always there. They actually knew the route. It's the same route. It's from A to B. It's just that as a silly Parisian coming to those cities, I just expected that it would be the same, and I was so wrong. And working with within the system, with mobility data, and learning more and more about digital transport for Africa and all the different initiatives, it opened my eyes. And that's actually how we all came here today. And with all the work 
uh, done at Mobility Data somehow, I thought, wait a minute. If there are initiatives already starting to map using GTFS to get informal transit on the map, and if we have actually GOFS with on-demand services, well, the bridge is there, isn't it? I mean, at the end of the day, it's still a route. It's somehow very similar to demand responsive transit. We can do it, we can map it. And the only thing we need is for all of you and us to come together to find a way for us to extend the standard to actually better represent the reality, to represent the ground, uh, what happened out there, what the matter to they how they function, where they go, and all the seom of the world, all the tuk-tuk of the world. And instead of us imposing how we see it, it should be the other way around. We should learn from how they work, and we should actually add more field to the next GTFS on-demand extension, add a more granular maybe vehicle description to be able to be inclusive. And also making sure that whatever we do, as Benji said, we rely on local communities. So we build capacity on the ground, and that is why we are very happy to support digital transport for Africa in the sense that, as Hein said, it's them who know. They know the system, and we need to make sure that when we digitize it, we don't break the system. We give them back. Uh, we make sure that they are not undercard, like in some super app, and that the data belong to them, that they can use it, that open source can actually create something for them to keep on having these riders, but make them slightly more discoverable to tourists or to the 12 years ago silly me who arrived for the very first time in Southeast Asia and discovered an entire new world. And making sure that there is trust, making sure that we here collectively find a way to tell them that let, let's help each other, let's learn from each other, because you have solved a couple of problems that actually maybe our big cities here should learn about. Because demand responsive transit was the basis of people having one or two mini buses and making sure they don't lose money. And through COVID, all public transit operators and agencies were all about, oh, but we're losing money having empty buses. Well, so this problem was solved a long time ago by people with three and four buses. They actually waited for the bus to be full before they started the journey. And that's actually what the message is, is if we are all coming to this together, well, not only we can map, we can create tools, we can let innovation happen. And Nairobi is one of the biggest city where you have a lot of actually very good software developers and engineers who can actually action uh, the what we create in terms of standardization and the data for uh, a innovation challenge proved it. So many submission, right? So people are ready for this. And what we can make sure of is that the wheel is not reinvented once more on both ways. And also, making sure that super apps like Grab, we can also learn from them. And they're not perfect, far from it. Uh, but they started by offering on-demand services with Moto Taxis and Tuk Tuk, and now they have expanded to all of this. So maybe this is the source of inspiration for us today. With that, I would like now to give the floor to Taylor. Uh, Taylor is responsible for ITDP worldwide work on impact evaluation and sustainable transport benchmarking. They are the author of Pedestrian First, the first ever worldwide ranking of walkability metrics that actually we used a lot here. <laughs> and the compact city scenario electrify, a study modeling the next 30 years of the global urban transport sector effect on climate change. Taylor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tita. And thanks again um, to you and all of your colleagues at Mobility Data for hosting us this week in beautiful Montreal. 
My name is Taylor, I use they, them pronouns, and I represent ITDP, the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy, a global NGO established in 1985 to promote sustainable and inclusive urban transport in low and middle income countries. We have regional offices locally run and locally staffed in countries from Mexico to Indonesia, and I represent our global research office based in Washington, D.C., USA. In Cairo, up until 2009, there were a lot of pigs. Why were there a lot of pigs in Cairo? People in Cairo are mostly Muslim. They do not eat pork. These pigs were the city of Cairo's waste disposal system. They ate the trash. They were kept by the Christian minority in Cairo. And they were actually a stupendously effective waste management system. And then in 2009, at the height of the uh, swine flu crisis, the government of Cairo decided to get rid of all of the pigs. Since then, the streets of Cairo have been overflowing with garbage in a way that they were not beforehand. The government of Cairo had been unable to see the way that this informal system solved a fundamental need much more efficiently than any advanced technological solution imported from the West could have done. I think the situation is the same with what we call informal or popular transport today. As Benji said, this informal transport carries perhaps as much as 80% of the world's urban passenger transport. As Haynes said, it's often considered illegal. It's often considered a nuisance and something that local governments want to be rid of. I recently, working with my colleagues at ITDP and at the University of California, Davis, completed a study projecting the next 30 years in urban passenger transport. And we found that neither vehicle electrification alone nor modal shift to walking, cycling, and public transit is sufficient to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement and limit climate change to less than one and a half degrees. If we want to limit climate change to less than one and a half degrees, we need both. And in order to achieve the amount of modal shift that will be necessary to meet that goal, we absolutely must work with informal transport rather than working against it and trying to replace it with much more expensive formal bus and train systems. So that leaves us as advocates, as planners around the world, having to convince the authorities that informal transit is worth working with. How do we do that? With data. And this is, I think, kind of a recap of what my colleagues have been speaking about and what they will be speaking about. Um, but of course, the, the value chain of data here has many steps and many parties that are necessary. This is a team effort. That's why we're all here. I see, and I, I could go into detail about each of these, but maybe that's better saved for the discussion. Um, these are just kind of examples of the different organizations and different platforms, exchanges, communities that are involved in each step of the chain. I'll talk about, of course, my role here, um, interpretation. So we heard from Hain about Digital Transport for Africa and how they're collecting this data. We heard um, from Tomar at Move It recently about their incredible efforts to collect this data. Um, and we've heard about mobility data. Actually, I don't think we've heard quite enough about mobility data's mobility database, which is a repository of GTFS feeds. Um, I think this is going to be an extremely valuable thing in the years to come, uh, and I'm really excited to work with them. Um, and that gets us to the interpretation step. Uh, so this is a map based on a map of Nairobi, everyone's favorite <laughs> city to work on, um, using, <laughs> Can follow your favorite. Um, using the Digital Transport for Africa, the, the Digital Matatus project data. And this identifies every place in the city that is within a short walk, I think a 10 minute walk of transport that comes every 10 minutes or better. And this is on pedestrians first, 
uh, as Juto mentioned, the and you can pull it up on your, your laptop or your phone right now, pedestriansfirst.itdp.org. And the, the amazing thing about this map is it's not just useful for city planners to look at, it actually describes progress on the UN Sustainable Development Goal 11.2, access to reliable public transport. And so if as we get more data describing informal transit, as we get that into mobility data's repository, and as we pull it into pedestrians first and other projects to come, we can actually help the international development community understand the way that informal transport not only contributes to, but is essential to meeting our sustainable development goals. And this could let us mobilize enormous amounts of sustainable development funding toward not competing with, but enhancing and supporting informal transport. So this is where we're at now. Um, unfortunately though, we only have this data for a handful of cities and we only have it at this kind of static format. So what's next? Where can we go? I've only put a couple of ideas up here for each stage of the process. I want to hear all of your comments on how we can improve each of these steps, how we can bring it all together. I think there's a lot more than an hour's worth of, of conversation material here. Um, but again, I'll, I'll come back to ITDP's role in interpretation. So this is, sorry, Hain, a map of access to destinations. Um, if anyone was here uh, in the previous session for, for Willem's excellent talk on measuring access to destinations, we are hoping to include this kind of metric in an upcoming atlas, the Atlas of Urban Transport, which is a new web platform that we currently have in development and we're planning to release in the fall of this year. Um, it will display not only that access to reliable public transport indicator, it will also display indicators of access to safe and comfortable bikeways, as well as sort of a measurement of 15 minute neighborhoods uh, and certain indicators of urban development and built form. And for cities where the data is available, we will include these kinds of measurements of access to destinations. If we ever got to the point where we had even indirect access to, even through an API of some kind, significant access to international GTFS data describing all kinds of systems, not only the ones where an agency is exporting GTFS, we could measure this in a standardized way worldwide and get it even, and possibly even have it adopted as a new UN Sustainable Development Goal, translating enormous amounts of funding toward not only investment in informal transport, but to the most effective investments in informal transport. You saw that graph, those two pie charts of transport funding and transport use in South Africa. Imagine if instead of pouring all that money into a rail service that's only used by 10% of the population, we could improve service on the informal transport lines that are carrying the majority of the city's population. How much that would help us get people out of cars and into low emission public transportation. We could maybe even achieve our climate goals and meet the Paris Agreement. And then imagine also what could be done if we could develop a tool that could use accurate data on informal transport to allow for scenario testing so that cities could say, oh, we're considering building a BRT here or here or investing in these informal transport lines, which would be the most efficient use of our funds? How much better all of our cities could be? Thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to the conversation after this. And thanks again to Mobility Data. We will now hear from Catalina, who is the transport specialist and data scientist at the Development Bank of Latin America. Uh, she is one of, of our only speakers who will actually tell you how our development bank can actually support getting data I and getting it yeah. better to improve the cities of the continent. Thank you. I, I can say that. I, I was afraid that you would say, like, Catalina can say a couple of expert things. So thank you so much for having me here, Tuto. It, it was great, all the conference, and I'm so happy to have a space to talk to you about the projects that we are working on. And we're recent members of Mobility Data, so we're very excited to collaborate in all the projects that I'm going to talk to you about. 
So a little bit about, I represent the CAF, the Development Bank of Latin America. So it's a development bank. So we promote sustainable development and integration of the region in Latin America and the Caribbean. And so we not only provide financial support for our countries, but also um, we generate knowledge to strengthen public policies and help governments to make better decisions. And a little bit about me. My name is Catarina Vanori. I come from Argentina. I have was asked if I dance tango. I don't do tango. Um, I'm a civil engineer. I did my master's in UC Berkeley. And uh, like all of you, I'm a data advocate. A little bit of context. I don't want to, the, the last thing I want to do is to duplicate things or um, repeat things that my amazing colleagues just said. Um, but basically, we have a different situation in the Global South regarding digitalization. So we know how valuable digitalization can be for our governments and to improve our, all of our operations. Um, a recent study from IDB like uh, calculated or estimated an increase on 6% in our GDP if we reduce um, costs, if you, we use better data and digital technologies. But at the same time, we have 76 of our public sector organizations in Latin America saying that they're very, um, they perceived themselves as lagging behind their peers. And I didn't quote this because it has not been published, but in our exercise, we have we have looked at 43 cities in all the Global South, and 37 of them only uh, do not have like transport and timetable data. Um, the rest, the 63%, uh, um, do have, but not specifically standardized. So, and the last IPCC um, report just told us and repeated us and enforce that digitalization can enable, of course, emission reduction to meet the global uh, Paris Agreement, but unless it is pr properly governed, it's not going to work. So we as a development bank, we're trying to help a little bit with that. So uh, with this context, I'm going to talk, about, talk to you about two projects. One is the Mobility Data Hub. We're all talking about mobility data. So, and the other project is our Urban Mobility Observatory. With this motivation, we, do, we have enough data in the formal sector, not in the informal sector, um, but we do have to organize it better. Uh, we need to give more access to data. And specifically, we need to ask the, the right questions and we need to generate Latin American specific work. And that's why we partnered with TUMI, the Transformative Urban Mobility Alliance, um, to create this Mobility Data Hub project. The Mobility Data Hub project has a general, like, global scope, but our first iteration, and as we're focused in Latin America, we're starting with, with uh, Latin American fo uh, scope. Our main consideration for this is that, well, the Urban Mobility Observatory, which I'll be talking about, um, has a great synergy because we're collecting data on uh, formal transportation uh, sources. We're trying to get to the informal, of course. In this particular project, and in actually in general in CAF, at CAF, we like the fact that we promote the use of traditional and non-traditional data, which is super uh, push that we need to do in our region. We still need to. We like to say that uh, we have been doing this in a participatory way. We have engaged with cities. We have engaged with other, other global partners um, and private companies as well. And we're following the privacy principles for, uh, for mobility data from our friends in WIRI. So the project overview and this, um, we have private companies, we have research universities, we have also the public, so I think that there's, in this project, it will be room for all of you to contribute, so uh, I'll be happy to, to chat anytime, and of course, if you have questions now. 
so the goal is to promote the digitalization, urban mobility, so through the use uh, and valorization of data, of course, to build more inclusive, sustainable, and livable cities. So that's our logo, our motto. And we started with saying, okay, we usually, and I've heard this from a guy from Google, which I talked to yesterday saying, oh, you guys like always ask for data, but you don't know what, like, what to do with that data sometimes. So we started from the top and we said, we created this conceptual framework. Um, so GovLab from NYU has this 100 questions methodology, which they apply in different domains. So we partner up with them to create the urban mobility 100 questions methodology. I'll talk to you about it in a minute. This methodology, the, the idea is to capture with a very participatory way uh, the most pressing public policy questions that we can answer with data. So the data that we so effortlessly collect have this a certain purpose. Then we have inside the project we had three very important components. Uh, digital platform, of course, to showcase all the data and all the work that we are we will be doing. We're doing three or four pilots uh, in three or four Latin American uh, cities just to say, hey, to show how to work with the government and show them the potential of data and how that a uh, specific exercise can help them um, better inform their decisions in specific projects like carpooling, uh, congestion pricing, public transit, etc. And lastly, we're uh, funding research projects saying, hey, um, people from um, universities or research groups, do you have a cool idea with an innovation or innovative methodology? What funding do you need to make it, this happen? And of course, with the Latin American focus, and uh, especially we, we give bonus points to research uh, focusing on gender equity, uh, informal transportation, uh, climate change. And all of this is supervised not only by us and by Tumi, but also we have hired a high level advisory board. So we have like four or five like top level uh, experts, data science. We have like people from uh, the University of Zurich. We have two or three very qualified practitioners. So they have been behind the scenes making decisions and a person from uh, to talk like to foster and to make sure we don't forget anyone. So we are very inclusive uh, in that sense. So the conceptual framework we chose for this project is the 100 questions. This methodology, is, it, it has been super fun. So the idea is to um, map the world's 100 most pressing high impact questions that can be answered if relevant data sets were leveraged. And it has a couple of steps and the idea is to uh, create a topic map. So we created with them a topic map, which I'll be showing to you um, of like specific topics inside urban mobility and transportation. So we g gave them the focus on the, the scope and the specific topics that we want there to be uh, and not to forget. Um, we created a 150 uh, people community that we, they call bilinguals, so they know about data and they know about transportation because in our region, we, we have encountered with a lot of people that work in transportation but are not very data oriented. So we are looking for people that know both sides. Then we ask those people, um, hey, this is a topic map. Um, what are the most pressing questions? If you would just like close your eyes and say, I, if I would have to think about two or three questions, uh, for example, for practitioners, or we have a couple of secretary of mobility people uh, that former, of course, and that was super rich uh, to know which are the most pressing questions that they had um, when they were um, in the government, but they didn't have the time like to sit and actually research on it and work on it because they had like more urgent pressing issues. 
And after that, the idea is to open to the public. So there will be a public voting. So I'll tell you more about dates, but stay tuned about that. And at the end, the idea is to match these top pressing questions with data sets or data collaboratives. So we, the idea is to create some uh, connections between data consumers uh, and data producers and vendors and all type of actors that can help answer these questions and think about a way of where we everyone can win. So we're now in this stage. We have received 113 um, mobility most pressing questions. We're in the process of clustering them. And the idea is to have a top 10 um, at the end so we can work, so we can focus our research and our money to answering those questions and not asking Google data that we still don't know what will kind of answer. So uh, I'll share a QR code if you want to teach in your, your most pressing question. That would be super helpful. The digital platform. So with all this conceptual framework, we'll do a digital platform pilots. So gathering data and collect, collecting data um, pilots, so real life applications and research. The digital platform, it will be a platform, a website, but the idea is that we don't duplicate other platforms. So we have been looking at other platforms uh, for data for public transit or all other platforms out there. So we don't want to duplicate things. We just want to build on top of uh, or help and contribute on top of all the efforts that have been uh, going around. And our, I think that our added value to this is that we're building, we're trying to build this with cities because at the end we do want the cities to um, get, have their own data hub, right? Like the ideal world is where cities have good data and they have a coordination between different agencies inside the city where they have a common language, so standards, and where private companies can fetch that data and use it and everything works perfectly. So we're trying to work towards that, and but for that we need to help cities. Uh, so we're doing a lot uh, around building capacity, institutional governance, so we're helping cities understand the importance of data, the standards, the privacies, because we have found that a lot of the a lot of public sector practitioners are very afraid of new technologies, especially in Latin cities. And so instead of going to the GTFS, they just said, okay, I, I'm, I'm cool with Excel and if I do something wrong here, my operator will complain and I will go to prison and I don't want to do that. Um, so we need to tell them and show them the power and the potential of this. The digital platform Data Hub will basically do a catalog of sources of data. So we data tree, basically all the leaves are um, the pieces of data that we think are important for an urban mobility study. We're not trying to collect data or to store data, but the idea is, is to build capacity so we don't have to store data. We just say, hey, if you would want to do an urban mobility study or if you want to learn from other cities, these are all the data uh, out there. These are all the actors that you can talk to. That's why mobility data was super awesome connection to us. Of course, we're, we want to promote the distribution uh, through APIs. We'll do some visualizations just to show cool things so people get interested in this. Um, and we'll work towards creating some analysis tools that are, will be aut automatic and from these APIs. So we can like start showing this the potential of data like on the platform. This is the data tree I was talking about. I will share the link, but basically each of the leaves are, um, I will not find GTFS, but like GTFS should be like around here. Um, so, and there's like planning, safety, all the, those pieces of data. Um, and we have done with Ublabs the exercise of going to the cities. Actually, first a desk research, and then um, asking the cities 
the pieces of data we didn't find. And we did ask about the licensing, who owns the data, who, uh, how frequently it's updated, uh, so we know how the data will come or will serve other users. Okay, that's the data hub. We'll be doing four pilots in this coming year, so it's, it's going to be a busy year. Um, we're working with these four cities in sp specific, in their specific uh, identified problems, and we will be helping them building capacity, institutional, technical capacity, so we will we'll, uh, hire local data scientists to work in the cities and to answer specific questions that they have. For example, uh, for Bogota, we're trying to create rules for a marketplace to for carpooling apps to come along um, and also some apps for congestion pricing so we have to deal with regulatory sides of this um, the licensing the payment uh, we're trying to figure that out so if you're a private company stay tuned um, also for Fortaleza we're um, looking at the there they have electric electric tricycles uh, for uh, recycling collection data, uh, collection garbage. And um, so we're helping them optimize routes. Um, there is a big inclusion uh, piece here because all the uh, recycling collection people are, are very, very excluded from, from the formal sector. And a couple of cool things which hopefully you'll uh, hear more about. And we'll be launching, as Hain said, um, or aligned with your uh, project, we are um, announcing in two weeks the winners of the three research papers with that we will be fund. The second project, and this is super uh, short, uh, sadly, because I love the, this project, is the Urban Mobility Observatory, which um, I know one person that have used the data from this. It's a project for, uh, it has like 10 or tw 12 years now, and we are building the third edition of the Urban Mobility Observatory. So we're also working with data, With we're also collecting data, but in this sense, not raw data that we call, but we're trying to build uh, KPIs for uh, cities based on the aligning with global agendas in these specific uh, domains, basically to create like a diagnosis of the urban mobili mobility of the, of the cities that are engaged with us. And also from that diagnosis, um, try to uh, identify the data gaps or the issues that the, the, um, the city might be having. And of course, in our role as a development bank, help them do that. We are transitioning this to a lab, lab actually, because it's not only our, an observatory, we're doing like a couple of uh, research and machine learning methodologies to help cities use the data that they are producing to infer mobility patterns, basically. We're, we're very concerned about the demand side of things. And that's a website, um, you can check it out. It's not finished yet, but it's there. So I'm, um, I'm finishing. What to expect from these two projects and from the bank? Uh, the mobility uh, data project will be uh, posting the 100 questions at the end of this month. So we will be going to the World Urban Forum and we will be announcing that um, so we can you can go into that into the website and 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 vote for your most pressing question we can also we're in the stage where if you share some most pressing questions that you have right now we can definitely cons uh, consider that we will do a first launch of the hub we will have pilot results hopefully <laughs> good ones and the the final integration of the hub with a lot of actors hopefully and the Urban Mobility Observatory will have a website version to a GitHub repository, so all the methodologies that we will use for indicators, accessibility, of course, and, and everything, uh, it will be open, open source, uh, so cities, research teams can, can 
replicate that. And hopefully someday around 2023, we have the matrix of indicators completed for most of the cities. So why am I showing this? Because maybe you're interested in a couple of things. If you're a private company, <laughs> for the pilots, we'll be kind of looking around for tech companies to hire and, and solve specific problems for the pilots. And also for the data hub, we'll be considering this, what we call analysis extensions. So basically the data hub is to catalog the data, visualize it and everything. But also we want to show, I don't know, a code that uh, automates the creation of isochrones. So we could put it there. And if you put the data of your city, you get that automatically. So that would be ideal. And all other extensions that you could think of. And we'll be also hiring that as well. So if you're interested in participating, um, scan this and you can like pitch in your questions. That will be super useful. And also if you put your email, you can like, I can uh, give you updates of, of this. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry, I, I went over, <laughs> but thank you. Thank you, Catalina. This was so we have 15 minutes for question and exchanges. Who would like to start? Well, move the uh, I'll do that. So uh, I have a question to the panel. Um, informal uh, transportation, right? It's um, y you showed me numbers I wasn't aware, of, but we are aware that this is a crucial uh, transportation system. Um, and an example when we uh, struggle with it in Mexico City, okay, um, nothing is stable, meaning you can come one day to the specific uh, a minibus, right, or and, and ask the driver what is the stops, even hop on and do the one and a half hour maybe trip uh, to map it. The other day it can change. Uh, not to mention fares, from my experience, it depends the mood of the driver, how you dressed, where you were uh, um, hopping on the bus, and the weather. So um, mapping it, or, or where it stops, right? Because it can, it, it's like on demand, kind of GTFS flex maybe, I don't know. So combining it and saying we want to map it and have some kind of sources to it has a lot of challenges built in that formal uh, has much less. So just if this is part of or how you handle it, uh, of your plan exactly. I think this is, a, this is an incredibly important question, part of the issue of adopting a data format from Portland, Oregon and expecting it to describe the whole world. Um, does any of my colleagues at Mobility Data have something to say about this? Um, thanks. Uh, yeah, I think I think I agree that yes, there are some things that are are very unique and 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 not Portland um, about a lot of other cities. At the same time, my personal experience in this space has been in in a previous job in in the intercity space. I worked for a company called Busbud, and we built up. Uh, database of the largest repository in, in most countries, in Argentina, the largest repository of, of city to city buses. Um, in Uganda, we had, had buses we had all over the world. And we did this by partnering with the local companies and, and, and treating them as the legitimate businesses that they are and, and aligning our business incentives. We weren't doing it you know, we're, as a development project. We were doing it as a venture capital backed startup. And I think we need to be careful with othering in this in this situation where we need to identify yes there are some unique needs there are some types of demand response that are quite different to how a lot of the systems in, in North America work at the same time a lot of the things probably could already be represented in GTFS um, with headway based services or um, you know different different things like that so I, I think it's a fine line between standardization and trying to adapt to communities and, and trying to make sure that we're not overthinking how different things are also. And, and I agree, absolutely. And I would add that I think that there's, like we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, right? We can't wait until we have the perfect format for describing every service. We have to make do with what we have 
because time is time is running out. Um, did that answer your question? Um, thank you for this uh, presentation. Has been amazing. Um, the question is for Catalina, Ecuadorian. So very happy to see Cuenca <laughs> in the in the Great. in the pilot cities. Um, I would love to touch base with you uh, to discuss how you are thinking about um, putting the KPIs indicators and comparing cities in a apples to apples way. Mm -hmm. But my question is, one of the things that you mentioned there is that you are working with those four cities, talking my Ecuadorian experience, political will, mm -hmm. and the urgency to see changes rapidly because you don't know what the next political cycle may look like. Um, so what things are you seeing to implement the recommendations that you are going to give to the mayor of Cuenca um, in the next elections that are coming in the next two or three years. So how you are thinking about volatility in the political landscape in Latin America, which is not, which is an issue. Yes. Um, thank you for your question. Uh, very challenging indeed. Um, but we deal with governments. So gov we help them. They are our clients as well. So we try to stay close to them. So with this all uh, changing uh, environment, uh, as we stay close, we know all the, the people that are around a government. And so we try to maintain very good relationships with them, first of all. And then uh, I think that building capacity around specific and technical uh, issue has helped us a lot to um, create transparency that it helps a lot. Actually, the, the politicians like told us that, oh, this KPI helps me like build some kind of transparency, even though sometimes the KPI like it's bad. But um, we have had like good experiences with uh, politicians that actually. Um, like working with us and and uh, showing results. On the other hand, we do have a lot of governments that we are have great projects. We have been working a lot in specific issue, and when the government changes, we're like zoned out, um, and that's our job, like to stay close to that. We have offices in. 15 countries in Latin America, and so we we try to to have a local presence. Yeah, that's that would be my my best answer. And about Cuenca, um, so they are doing great. They have great mobility projects. They have the 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 new tram, the and they're building the the they are installing the bike share system. Um, so there are a lot of things to do there. Uh, and they have a great te technical team, which we, for these specific projects, we do look for uh, some technical skills to begin with. Uh, we, have, we do have other projects um, that we, I, I was telling you, Andrew, uh, it's not here, but uh, we're working with, uh, in La Paz, with some uh, private companies, for example, the. A uh, trash collector company um, came to us with good data that the government didn't want to accept from them because you are a private company. L me as a public sector, I don't want to accept your data or wh whatever. So we are identifying those situations as well to create this connection with the public sector. We're kind of an, in a neutral, we like to call it a neutral position. So we encourage co governments with this conversation and the urban mobility will have like a summit uh, uh, at the end of the year to create this network of mayors, hopefully, or secretaries of mobility uh, to share experiences and continue to trust us. But let's stay in touch. Thanks so much for the, the panel. It was really useful. Um, my question is more around from the from the user's perspective. So I think if we think about what was discussed here, there's a lot of benefit to the cities, to the governments, to all of the, like the, the consumers and the producers of the data. 
Um, but if we look at it from the user's perspective, a local in Nairobi or Kampala using informal transport knows how to get from A to B. They do it every day. Uh, and so is there a risk that we are, as a developed nation, trying to fix a problem that isn't really a problem or that's something that, that isn't broken? Um, and if we are thinking that there is a user benefit for the locals who use this every day, um, what would you say that looks like? So not necessarily from a user perspective, I agree with you that a lot know how to go from A to B, but what we have seen also is a new generation of users uh, who are more connected and who m m more often than not uh, studied abroad and came back. And they are asking for more reliability. They are asking for a change. They are also very much aware that they need to be the actors of the change to see their cities, their countries, their areas not disappear. And they also want to make it right because talking from example, 12 years in Saigon, uh, one of my uh, former colleagues was sent to study to France with two parents who were motor taxi drivers. And when she came back, she was like, I want to help them make sure they don't miss the train. Because if the grab of the world is going to force everyone into using the app and undercutting their resources, my dad, who used to always sit at that corner and help someone go always the same route from A to B, if he's not discoverable anymore and the only choice is to use an app, then he's losing resources, then my sister, my brother, will not be able to go to school. So I think there is that real demand, and what we want to make sure is that we make it right for them. But it's only coming from that corner and that uh, area of the world, but I think Hein has also. Yeah, so I've seen, uh, like, in terms of technology, so people in, like, Uganda in Kampala, so the safe border is an example of where you can see uh, where you're going. It's not technically mapped, but like the route. So you can call the uh, border driver, essentially the taxi driver, and then they will pick you up. Uh, the, it's safer, especially for women, and they feel secure because they know where the ride is coming from here to here. Um, yeah, so that's a good one example that I can think of. So I think of it more like a census data uh, mapping uh, in terms of, because uh, is it really useful for the uh, eventual user? Uh, you don't know what you don't know until you are being exposed. Isn't that all about marketing? I don't know. So, <laughs> so uh, there is a there's a use case of that, and then there there is also a danger in terms of uh, um, current situations. Uh, maybe you might not want to expose the the whole map uh, for all, uh, because that's the way the, uh, things are functioning right now. So there is a. You have to be cognizant of that. And then we have talked with the city government that says, like, this route doesn't exist. <laughs> because, yeah. Uh, and then what do you do? I don't know. So it's, it's, it's going back to counting and also who's counting and what's being counted, I guess. Uh, so yeah, we just have to be very careful about things. I would like to add something. Um, so you said if, um, if we w were like putting a problem where there's not, but I, I think there are a couple of them. So they're using that transportation because there's no other option. And most times it's very expensive. So there, they, there are studies on like the percentage of the household um, uh, wage on spent on transportation and those numbers are huge. Um, also since uh, tr uh, drivers are driving fast and there's like road safety issues around informal transportation as well. And we're in places where you cannot like call the moto taxi uh, being a woman, a woman, um, there are also gender safety uh, issues. So bes besides, so we need to uh, kind of act uh, on that because of the people that are using formal transit right now, um, because of course the population that uses informal transit are vulnerable most of the time, but also to um, kind of uh, increase the quality of the service to create this model shift uh, and kind of combat 
climate change. Thank you, Faiza, for the question. If I can uh, just add, I think that whether or not this data is useful for the user, it has immense non-commercializable value for society. And I think that that's something I really want everyone to walk away with from this discussion, especially because this is an audience more of people in the city level, private and public sectors. And so much of this value can only be realized at the international level. Um, and, and so I do want to encourage people to, to think about this a little bit differently and step back from this focus on the user, even if there is great value to the user in, in certain ways. Thank you, Taylor. And we will close the session with this very wise word from Taylor, because they are, they are wise. Uh, and yes, let's all step back and think about how we can actually help, but not always profit from it on a commercial viewpoint. With that being said, thank you for joining us for this amazing session. A big round of applause for my co-panelists. <laughs>